Hello, welcome to the latest episode of Lifting the Lid. Uh, my name is Andy Ely, I'm a Senior Funeral Director with G Seller Independent Funeral Directors and we've been serving bereaved families since 1910. Now I'm sure you're well aware there's lots and lots of different myths and misconceptions and different stories about what happens uh, within the funeral profession. So we've decided to put this series of podcasts together to try and dispel some of those myths and answer any questions. So please do like, share and subscribe to um, Lifting the Lid. Ask any questions to liftingthelid at gseller.co.uk and we'll do our absolute best to answer them for you. It genuinely is our family caring for your family. Now today it's a difficult subject, it's a difficult topic. I'm joined by Lauren from The Honest Mum and she talks about baby loss and parenting from a very honest perspective. Lauren, thank you for being here. Welcome and thank you for travelling. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Lauren, tell, tell us about yourself. Let's, let's have a bit of an introduction. So I am Lauren. I'm a mum of three. Um, I have a one-year-old, a three-year-old and my son Leo passed away at eight days old. So I tend to talk about all things, the ups and downs of parenting, the, you know, the realities, it's not all Absolutely. rainbows and sunshine. Yeah, um, vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, baby loss, I think it's a topic that people often don't want to talk about. And we had a difficult journey to actually get Leo. Um, we had fertility treatment for six years and then we had IVF. Um, we were lucky at IVF was successful first time, but then... Um, we I went into labour at 20 weeks, so okay. uh, we didn't tell anybody I was pregnant until 20 weeks, and then we had a gender oh, reveal okay. party, and I went into labour five days later at tw yeah 20 weeks. Okay. What happened from there? Uh, I so the first time I went into hospital, they told me that everything was fine and just you know go home. The next day I went in, I was still having problems, and they told me I was in active labour, you know, prepared to say goodbye. Um, they managed to put a stitch in my cervix and okay. keep Leo in. So I was in hospital for four weeks. Uh, my husband slept on the floor, like refused to leave. Yeah, he did the nurse's sort of job and looking after me and said, you know, I can handle it, looked after me. Every day or every other day we were taken to delivery suite, you know, prepared to say goodbye. Um, he wasn't viable at 20 weeks, you know, 21 weeks. So 24 weeks is the viability period. Yeah. Um, at 23 weeks, we were transferred to a higher level, like NICU, neonatal intensive care unit, who okay, could prepare you. for Leo <laughs> if he was born prematurely. Then, um, then after about two days of me thinking I just had trapped wind and I was in a lot of pain, they said okay. I was actually in labour. Oh, um, really? Okay. My cervix was eight and a half centimetres dilated with a stitch still in, which is really dangerous, so they moved me over to delivery suite and it was very busy there were lots of people coming in and out and we were given two options one was if he was born trying to breathe they would try and help him and if he was born and he wasn't breathing then they would just provide comfort care so it's a very traumatic Absolutely. labor not knowing what was going to happen um then thankfully he was born breathing and it was a big flurry of people through the room um, and okay. stabilized him and took him sort of up to NICU. Um, then the first five days were sort of brilliant. He was doing really well and then started to sort of go downhill from there. Uh, we were able to have cuddles with him once so we were able to sort of hold him but he had lots of tubes and stuff in and then um, day eight they told us he had a significant bleed on his brain and we he wouldn't lead the life that we wanted him to lead so yeah. we made the decision to like turn off his life support not an easy decision no but the right one you know yeah. we we i always said we suffered then so that he didn't have to suffer sort of in life okay. we didn't want him to have any pain or discomfort and something that my mum always says to me is she remembers me saying thank you. She remembers in that moment that the doctor came to me, and I can still visualize it now, the doctor came over to me and she just said, there's nothing more that we can do and I'm really sorry. And I said, thank you, because I knew that they'd done everything that they could. Absolutely. You know, they, they felt that emotion like we felt it and they really cared and they had looked at every single avenue they could look at and nothing was working and he was just too poorly and he was on the cusp of even being viable to 
to be alive. You know, at 24 weeks and four days, he was just on, and he was 838 grams. He was tiny. Oh, tiny, bless Really him. tiny. Oh. So, I mean, that piece that you just mentioned there around, um, they did their absolute best. I mean, from a, a funeral director's perspective, that, that's, we kind of feel your pain too. Mm -hmm. We sort of take a bit of onus and want to do our absolute best, nowhere near the pain that you feel. Of course, it's really difficult for us to go for it. We have, we have lots of support mechanisms, co coping mechanisms to assist as well. You have your own in-house bereavement we services. We absolutely do, yeah. So they're, they're more for um, families. Uh, we're in various different bodies that we can communicate with if, if we as individuals are struggling. Amazing. But I mean, from your perspective, how, how did people react? I mean, did they, did they treat you differently? Did they? We were really lucky that we had an amazing family support system and our friends. We had friends that came and stayed with us um, and looked after us. And something that I always tell other people to do is we had friends that sent us like packages of like body wash and deodorant with just okay. a note that said, in case you don't feel like leaving the house, yeah. you know, we ha and meals and stuff like that. We had such a good support package. And because I do blog quite openly and I, I say to people, it's, ask me, like, it's okay to, to talk to me about it. And I don't think I experienced the same taboo that a lot of other people do feel because people don't feel like they can approach someone and talk about the loss of a baby yeah, whereas absolutely. with me I'm very open and I, I'd rather someone ask me a question that they didn't feel comfortable asking somebody else because then I can break down that barrier and you know most people that have lost a child or anybody they want to talk about it but people don't want to bring it up because they don't want to upset them yeah. but they already know that they've lost them they haven't it's not new to them you're not going to upset somebody asking about their baby because most people want any given opportunity to be able to talk about it because they don't get the opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's difficult to know what to say, isn't it? I mean, you've just said there that you're, you're an open book, you, you want to talk. Your husband's perspective, because um, typically males, we, we don't talk. It's, we tend to bottle things up. How, how was he? Um, in the initial stages, so when we had to say goodbye to Leo, we read him a book and at that point, um, I was really strong and I, I had this thing in my head that I didn't want him to leave this world surrounded by sadness. So I was able to keep it together and not cry and he was really upset and was very visibly upset. But then once Leo passed away, the roles completely reversed okay. and I completely broke down and he looked after me. And when uh, we were able to spend the night with Leo, which initially we weren't very sure we wanted to do, but it was actually one of the best things we did because they had a cuddle cot, so he had a cold mat that he could lay on and we spent the night Absolutely. with him with no machines, no noises, no tubes. You know, we could actually see what he looked like. Um, and I think we sort of were both very emotional together then. Okay. And then my dad and James went off to register the birth and the death at the same time. My mum stayed with me and Leo. Um, and from that moment onwards, I broke and James looked after me. Okay. So it was very, we're very much a team. We always have been through everything. And we always say one of us goes down, the other one will pick it up. So we, yeah, we, we tend to sort of take it in turns to, to not be okay. But I think there is a, um, a thing that men don't tend to talk about it. And yeah. he also has like a page. So I'm the honest mum. He started a page almost to take the mic called the honest dad. So to oh, okay. give like a dad's perspective. Um, but he will also talk about Leo and he appeared on a, a podcast talking about grief as well. So he's appeared doing like a dad's perspective. Brilliant. Um, because he wanted to open up that conversation from the man's point of view. I think, I think it is, it's really important conversations, isn't it? Definitely. All around. And that's kind of the purpose of these podcasts, really. Absolutely. Just to, yeah. just to make people aware. Um, and we never had that, like you guys offering the in-house bereavement service. Mm. We were never offered any, you know, we're nearly four years down the line, nearly five years down the line. And neither of us have had any counselling that has been provided for okay. the period of losing, a, you know, for the point of losing a baby. Um, I've sought out my own therapy and James has never had anything. We were offered, we were told it was a year wait before we could access any oh, therapy. Okay. And so by that point, I, I just, I'd already sort of closed off and I dealt yeah. with it in my own way and had my own processes to do that. But if we'd had that in-house services. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's really important. I mean, we just briefly touched on it, but absolutely. I mean, the funeral, which is kind of from the, the funeral director's perspective, it isn't the final piece. 
bereavement doesn't finish at that point. Definitely. So I think it's really important and, and this is something we do offer because we recognise we need to carry on with that bereavement journey and help where we can. Absolutely. And that's why we offer the service. And sometimes the funeral is the beginning for people because it feels surreal when that point of yeah, it's a bit death of up until the funeral and then that's the point where it actually sinks in that, especially if you've been able to like see the body, like we visited Leo every day in the yeah. funeral home. So the point of like it being the last point that we could see him, it made it more real after that that we couldn't see him so sometimes yeah the funeral is like the beginning of the grief almost the cuddle cot piece that you mentioned um was that at the hospital was that did at you the hospital get to go home um no i uh, we were offered to take yeah. leo home i just for me i didn't feel like that would have been appropriate I, not appropriate i didn't feel like that would have been right for me emotionally mm -hmm. um leo was born in hospital he lived his whole life in hospital and i feel like if I'd have taken him home, I would have really struggled when I was at home. He had never lived in our house. And I think I would have struggled to give him back. Yeah. Um, because I needed that, like, that barrier of he's gone and that's okay. And I need to go home and grieve and not have him at home with me. That piece that you just mentioned there about giving back, um, I've, I've, I've seen these cuddle cots um, at home, you know, and that is the difficult piece. It's kind of why I asked whether you didn't use it in a hospital or at home. I think it is hard. It's really hard. And I think you never know how you're going to feel until you're in that moment. And yeah. I mentioned that we had Leo overnight. And when they first asked us if we wanted to do that, I was adamant that I didn't. I thought it was odd. Yeah. I'd never lost a baby before. And I, you know, I'd lost adults in my life, but adults, you get to see them after and yeah. they've lived their whole life. And we hadn't had any memories with Leo. So for us to be able to create little memories and you know, really take in the details of his face, having that time. I'm glad that we did that. And I'm glad that the hospital gave us that option. But then when it came to the Cuddlecott at home, I knew from having that night with him that that was enough and I didn't yeah. need to take him home. And we just like, were able to go into the funeral home. And the place that we had, the lady's name was Christine. She was amazing. Brilliant. I came to visit g yesterday and the vibe that Christine gave us is the same as g -Seller. It's family you feel comfortable it's somewhere you feel that you can go and they get it like it's yeah. it's the right atmosphere everything was taken care of for you and we felt so comfortable being able to ask you know can we spend more time can we stay longer can we do this can we dress him can we have and it was always yes absolutely yes you know yeah, as it should be yeah just there to try and support you really i'm Definitely. glad you had that i was going to ask you about a funeral you, you had a funeral service we did yeah we did have a funeral for leo um we had him cremated we had like a celebration of life rather than a funeral obviously he was only tiny most yeah, of our friends see. and family didn't get to meet him um so yeah we had a celebration of life and we had lots of people come together for that and just to support us and when leo passed away as i said we read him a book so james okay. and i stood at the funeral and we read that book to i don't know just and the circle, I guess, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, Leo's funeral service, um, I mean, before, obviously, Leo passed away, you was aware this could potentially happen. Did you start considering a funeral, you know, before you gave birth, or...? Not before I gave birth, but from about day five, I could see Leo's deterioration. And I'm the sort of person that I like to plan, and... If I plan for the worst case scenario and then anything above that is a bonus. Okay. So my go-to was he's probably going to pass away. So if I plan that he's going to pass away and then he doesn't, then I'll be okay. Whereas if I plan that he's going to be okay and then he's not, then I won't be okay. Okay, yeah. So I sort of started talking to James and saying, and he said, I don't want to talk about it. And I was like, well, I need to tell you what my opinions are. And we made the decision already that if they said he wasn't going to live the life that we wanted, then we would turn off his life support. So okay. when they came to us with that decision, we were already ready. It wasn't like a to and fro. We knew that if the life, he wasn't going to live that life that we wanted him to and that was best for him, we weren't going to put him through that. So at that point, I started to think, I hadn't looked into funeral directors. I just started to think, what would we want? We'd want it to be a celebration. Okay. Um, and then after we'd met our funeral directors I think we probably just 
Googled a local one. Oh, okay. Um, so did the hospital give you any support in that previously? So you've, you've, you've made this incredibly difficult decision to turn the life support off. Mm -hmm. What support did you get from the, um, the hospital at that point? Because we, we wanted to talk about the funeral. Did they give you any options? Did, so you've mentioned you Googled the funeral director there. Yeah. But, I mean, was there any assistance there from, from the hospital at all? We were out of area, so I, I don't... I, we were given a pack of information, but okay. I think it was more about loss rather than about funerals. Um, I think we were off, also offered to speak to, like, a chaplain, um, but I didn't want that. So okay. I just remember leaving with nothing. And I, I came in pregnant and with a baby and I left with nothing. So then I went away and I... I think, as I said, I Googled and found someone local to us um, okay. who, you know, really pulled us through all the decisions and gave us what we wanted. And I already knew that I wanted a cremation rather than a burial. Okay, so why, why would that be? Why, why cremation rather than...? Um, I don't know. Okay. We weren't rooted where we were. So we'd moved away from family to, to live where we lived. And I just felt like if we had a burial, we would be stuck there. Um, so okay. we've now moved. We now live in Eastbourne. Um, so we would have, I would never have moved if we'd buried Leo. Yeah. Whereas his ashes, like we've got them in rings, but we also have like a box of his ashes on our shelf. So yeah. wherever we go, he can come with us. So I think if you're very rooted in, you're always going to stay where you are, then that might have been a consideration. But I knew that we didn't want to stay where we were, so it just wasn't ever an option for us. Okay. Something that I'm quite often asked, and actually we found out only after Leo had passed away, is that, well, I know for us, Leo's funeral was free. Is that a standard across the industry, or is that just something per area? So for the most part, is that, I guess that ethical piece, really, it doesn't feel right to charge for a children's funeral service or a child's funeral service. Um, I mean, you can get support from the the government. So that's the um, the Children's Funeral of England Fund, I believe, is the, the title. For the most part, certainly locally to this area, um, crematoria they tend to waive the fee. Um, mm -hmm. Us as funeral directors, usually there's a kind of a, a cap of an age limit where a a simple or a simpler funeral service is is free of charge. And basically. is that up to eighteen? <laughs> yes, but not not for every. Sometimes it's 16. It, okay, it depends sure. on the, the, uh, the, the funeral provider, I okay, guess. Right. But it tends to be waived. If you have anything a little bit, perhaps a little bit more above and beyond, so perhaps a horse-drawn yeah. um, dove releases, something a little bit more additional, yeah. there probably would be fees for that. Yeah, because it's something that I get asked a lot. People come to me and they yeah. say, I've lost a baby and this, that and the other has happened and how am I going to afford this? And yeah, and it's something else you don't want. It's just something you don't even want to have to think about is the money aspect. So one of the things I always say is it should be free. So knowing that it it's a sort of standard in the government a, funded scheme, a I can... Very low level charge, okay. it should be. Perfect. Yeah. I think that's really important for people to know. It's can't vouch for different areas. I, I, I can't talk about different crematoria around the country, but for the most part there's either waived or a real low level fee and yeah, it should that's, be that's something I'll pass as I say it's just something ethical it, it just doesn't feel right to, to do it yeah absolutely would you do anything differently in terms of like a funeral service um I don't I don't think so I've never really thought about that that's yeah so if you kind of look back on things is obviously you're in the moment um, and you're being guided through all these different options and there's a lot going on yeah but now you're you obviously you're able to talk now, and you're out, not necessarily the other side of search, but it's a bit easier for you to talk. Just that on reflection, is there anything you would do slightly differently? I don't think there is. I think we, we had people that we wanted there, and I think we had everything that we wanted to have, and we hit all those things. You know, we had, we read the book, and we sort of rounded off his story by reading the book we read to him as he passed away and we had a funeral where he had a coffin and uh, you know he, he came in and we had music and I think we did everything that we wanted to, to do and then as I said we had his ashes and we had his ashes made into jewellery yeah. so 
I, I don't think there's anything that I think, oh, I wish I'd really done mm. that. That would have meant a lot to me. But I think, as I said, we had an amazing funeral director who made sure that we knew what all of our options were. And I think, unfortunately, not everybody has yeah, somebody was, that guides them through. I was going to say that that tells me if you're happy with everything that you had there, that funeral director has, has done the job correctly. That's absolutely. exactly what you should be having, experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, bless you. And what about your coping me mechanisms? I mean, how, how do you cope with this? Um, I, d I think everybody's different and everybody, c and, and how I cope is different. Every, you know, some days I'm fine and some days I'm not. And I went on to have two more children quite quickly, um, which okay. was stressful in itself because there was no, uh, like what happened with Leo could easily have happened again. So, yeah, yeah. uh, with, so six weeks after Leo passed away, uh, six weeks after Leo's funeral, I went into, um, sorry, six weeks after Leo's funeral, I got pregnant naturally okay. um, with Teddy, bearing in mind that Leo was IVF. We thought we were going to have to go down that route again. Yeah. Got pregnant naturally. I was put on bed rest till 38 weeks. So that was a very stressful pregnancy. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, and then Teddy was born via C-section because I, for myself, I didn't want a natural labour because yeah. just the associations of how stressful Leo's labour was. Um, but I feel like everything got, all the grieving got sort of pushed back and pushed back and pushed back um, because I was busy and I was trying to focus on, you know, growing another baby. And the coping mechanisms were that I shared my journey and I shared my story. And Brilliant. helping others helps me, knowing that if I put something out there that it's okay to feel X, Y, Z and someone goes totally get that yeah. that makes me feel like Leo's life wasn't in vain because I can help other people by Ab telling his story absolutely and I think I think that's certainly the case you did you have mentioned on your your page about the the box analogy the box and the ball uh, can you talk, talk <laughs> me through that I'll try and do it justice <laughs> <laughs> so I came across this analogy which was that when you lose somebody um, you, there's a grief ball yeah, absolutely. and there's a button and every time that button is pressed you feel that grief just like when it first happens when you first lose somebody and you're overwhelmed with grief um, and the ball is as big as the box and it's just constantly hitting that button and you're constantly flooded with grief and as time goes by the grief doesn't get any less but the box gets bigger and the ball gets smaller so the button gets hit less often and the ball's yeah. floating around in that box but every so often it could be an anniversary it could be a song it could be absolutely nothing that you realize is a trigger the ball hits the button and you feel that wave of grief all over again and i think that analogy really helped me realize that there's some days where i just feel like i was losing my mind i'd be like i've been fine for months weeks months years you know and then suddenly i feel like I was the day that we were told he wasn't able, you know, yeah. that we had to turn off his life support. And that analogy really helped me realise that, oh, and we always say now, it's just the ball and the button. Like, it, okay. it is what it is, you know, it's it's part of grief and, you know, you go through those stages of grief, but there's always going to be a point where, as I say, be it an anniversary or whatever it is, that you feel that like the day it happened and it's it just overwhelms you. And I think that's Absolutely. whether it's a baby, a mum, or anybody, whoever, when you lose somebody, the grief is consuming at some point isn't it yeah absolutely you've got two two children yes are they aware of leo i mean how, how did they respond to yes uh they were both born after leo so yeah. uh teddy as i say is nearly four and lily is going to be two next week okay and they know that leo is their brother that lives in the stars oh lovely so uh we have uh like rings with his ashes in so okay. they know this is leo and we have Tattoos. So my husband and I both have this matching tattoo, and we also have this as a, an iron-on that he has on a shirt, and we had at his funeral. Um, and they know that Leo lives in the stars. We've got photos of him. They know about him, and yeah. um, so he will always be a part of our life. Um, and it's important that they know who he is. So you're keeping Leo's memory alive there, but you take it one step further than that, don't you? Yeah, uh, as I said, everyone copes differently. And for me, one of the ways that I cope is helping others and giving back. And we, as I said, in that moment that we were told Leo wouldn't live, I said thank you. And that's 
a massive part of who I am is showing that we're thankful. You know, as I said, we we keep in touch with Christine who did Leo's funeral and we send her flowers. Brilliant. Um, because it was so important to us. So for Leo's would have been his first birthday, we did Rack for Leo, which is random act of kindness for Leo. Okay. So we gave flowers, coffee and chocolates to the all the emergency services. We took cakes to maternity units, um, just as a way of giving back and saying thank you. And we put a little bit on there about baby loss, you know, one in four pregnancies ends in loss. And that's a really powerful That's a real statistic. big statistic, isn't it? That's, that's a lot. It is. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to do something to keep his memory alive, but you know, celebrate his life um, and allow people to talk about him and allow people to ask questions. And then every year it's just sort of grown, you know, we, we shared on social media what we did that year and the next year more people wanted to get involved. So all across the country, all across the world, there's a lady in New Zealand who took uh, cakes and coffees to her local maternity unit with little Rack for Leo flyers and it got bigger and bigger. And we, the year of COVID we did, um, a live stream and we had over 2,500 people in the live wow, stream okay. and huge companies donated prizes that we gave away and it was just amazing. Uh, so we just try and give back, Absolutely. spread kindness, you know, where we can because something bad happened to us but that doesn't mean, I think everybody reacts in different ways and for me, I could let it consume me and I could be angry and I could be negative but that's not going to help me. It helps me to talk about Leo, to like come here to help and other people. Yeah. talk about other people and actually say it's okay to talk about it. And yeah. I have a lot of people message me off the back of Rack for Leo and say, I never knew you lost a baby. People that are as old as, you know, my mum and my grandma who message and say, I've never felt able to talk about a loss that I had because back then it was swept under the carpet. Yeah. It was yeah. taboo that like you do not, you know, it happened and keep that to yourself and that's not healthy. So I encourage people to talk to me um, and to talk in general and to tell people about their loss. And I ask people, if you want to send me photos, if you want to talk about, please do. Like I'm, I don't think it's morbid. I think it's healthy to talk yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. So you just said there that, that historical piece, society has changed a huge amount. Yeah. Um, again, referring to this podcast, the, the taboos, we're trying to sort of dispel them. I think it is important that we do talk about it and what you're doing, that's, that's wonderful. It, yeah. it really is. I think it's really just important to open up the conversation. Around, yeah. And that's why I think this podcast is going to be incredible because the, people have so many questions and it's the unknown and it's scary. And when you're faced with death, and the potential and you know it's a journey we're all sort of heading to yeah, but a yeah. lot of people find that they don't want to talk about it because if they talk about it it might mean that it'll happen quicker yeah. it's like a it's a weird thing isn't it but for me I like to know everything I like to know what happens and it's comforting for me you know we knew that Leo was so looked after and I know the standards that Christine had behind and the standards that you have are high for looking after somebody and you treat them as if they're your family. And that was how we felt Leo was treated. And it was so important to us to, yeah. you're treated with respect in life and in death. And Absolutely. that's how it should I'm be. I'm so glad you've had that experience. Yeah, it's so important. Not the experience overall, of course, but you know, the experience of that, that, that care, that yeah, level of care. definitely. Really important. Lauren, thank you. Thank you for being so honest. No, thank you for having me. It's, it's been, and the whole team are amazing. You, the company are incredible. I was so lucky to have a tour yesterday and you're like nobody else. You are above and beyond amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's all a team thing. It's absolutely we're all here to try and help where we can. Yeah, definitely. So thank you again, Lauren. Thank you. Um, thank you for your, um, your attention, for, for logging in. As I say, please do like, share, subscribe. Um, send those questions. Send them to liftingthelid at gseller.co.uk. And, um, and we'll see you next time.